All right, good morning. From all around California, it's lovely to be here with you all again. Happy August. All right, make yourself at home. So the California Climate and Energy Collaborative team is pleased to welcome you back for our now 21st meeting of the Local Energy Resources Network. And just hope you all are finding ways to stay cool this hot August. Uh, today, my background is featuring a summer sunset on the coast of San Diego. Uh, in the chat, we would love for you to introduce yourself. Tell us what part of our beautiful state you are in at this moment. And as always, we always love it if you turn on your webcam just so we get to know you a little bit better if you're comfortable doing so. Slide. Um, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Angie Hacker. I'm the SEEK Statewide Best Practices Coordinator, joined today by a couple of other members of the SEEK team. So John and Kelsey, they'll say hi over chat. You can always reach out to them if you have a technical issue. And as always, these one hour meetings that we've been doing now for a couple of years, they're designed to provide a space for local governments and those that work with them to, to dive in on programs and opportunities that can help them advance their energy and climate goals. So we know you're out there super busy right now. There's so many opportunities. So you are come here, you get briefed, and hopefully it's a little easier for you to go out and pursue the things that are applicable to you. So today's another chance to do that. We're gonna go through an opportunity round table. We have a spotlight with a featured speaker from Cal MTA, who's gonna to talk to us for a few minutes. <clears throat> and then another, our larger presentation today is with our friends at the Institute for Local Government, uh, folks from the Boost program. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we did a survey and a lot of you guys said, hey, not only do we wanna hear about funding opportunities and other programs, we wanna hear a little more about how to get them. And so that's what they're gonna focus in on today is some tips and tricks, advice um, for how to access these dollars a little bit easier. Then stick around, we'll have a little bit more of a discussion at the BPC workshop and an informal conversation opportunity there at the end during our bonus breakout for anybody who wants to bring up some other topic. All right, so let's get into it. <clears throat> Here's our uh, opportunity round table uh, slide. It's busy as always because there's a lot going on and we built it this way to be a hyperlinked cheat sheet, not to be a work of art. So it's a little bit messy. Um, but you're going to get access to this, so don't stress out. You'll have access to this with all the hyperlinks on it. And um, folks that my on my team are going to drop chat, um, drop links in the chat as we talk about things. So we're going to work through some of these opportunities, not all of them, just the ones that are highlighted in order of due date. <clears throat> and a lot of what we're going to focus on today is actually in clean transportation funding, which we don't always talk about, um, but there's a few right now that I wanted to raise to your attention. And as always in the chat, we would love if you could put anything that you're hearing from your vantage point. Is there a funding opportunity we've missed? Is there an opportunity to learn something, an event, um, other kinds of assistance out there you're hearing about? Please help each other out and help us track all of this around the state. So before we talk about clean transportation, I want to harp a little bit more on this EPA Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, the salt that they're calling Solar for All. We talked about it last time. There's $7 billion here, but this is a big federal program. It's supposed to award up to 60 grants to state, territories, tribal governments, municipalities, and eligible nonprofits. And the goal is to expand low-income solar programs that provide financing and technical assistance. It can include workforce development, but really it's targeting low-income and disadvantaged communities resident with residential solar. And so this one is such a big one and I suspect um, it will be very competitive. And I'm bringing it up again because the due date for a notice um, for an intent to apply is August 14th and that's so soon. So hopefully if you're already thinking about it, this is something you've been working on and probably out there gathering up your partners because I imagine um, a larger scale impact might be a really good uh, way to be competitive in this solicitation. I know that I believe the state of California through the California Energy Commission is going after something and I'm hearing a little bit here and there around the state of some other folks that might be going after it. Um, I want to give a little space here if anybody wants to actually share anything out loud like if you're out there pulling together a proposal still looking for partners. Um, I'm going to give a little a little window here of space. You can throw it in the chat or raise your hand. Uh, I also want to mention, and you know, if anybody does that, let me know. Um, 
I also want to mention this is something that would be a good opportunity to put on the need or have board. This need have board, we're going to drop the link in the chat as well to Jamboard. It's an informal opportunity to share, hey, I have this need, I have an RFP, I have a need for a grant partner, or I have something, I have this funding op funding I can re-grant out, I have um, technical assistance to provide. So it's just like a digital built bulletin board. If you're somebody wrapping up your EPA grant and you're still looking for certain kinds of partners, that's something you might put there. Maybe you're out there trying to become a partner to a grant, put yourself there too. Did anybody raise their hand or chat? Guys, I don't see. Okay, sorry, I'm on a one screen travel day, so I'm not seeing the chat. So everybody can alert me. Um, okay, so let's keep going. Um, so on clean transportation, I was on a good call yesterday with, or uh, last week with the Department of Transportation. They have a new program called Protect. Um, and so I would just, I'm bringing this up because it's pretty, pretty in, trans in the pocket of transportation. Um, I know not a lot of you guys are, are full on transportation folks, but you might make your transportation people aware of this new federal funding program. Um, it is uh, funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's called Promoting Resilient Operations for Transformative, Efficient and Cost-Saving Transportation, so PROTECT. It's to help make surface transportation more resilient to natural hazards, including climate change, and other natural disasters through support of planning activities, resilience improvements, community resilience and evacuation routes and at risk coastal infrastructure. Does this sound more like adaptation and resilience? Yeah, that's not always in our bucket, but I imagine if you have some things that you're looking to plan for just in terms of general climate action, this might be a place to look for dollars. Um, it is due August 14th short window. I'm going to try to get these things out ahead of you a little bit sooner. Um, and there's $848 million available nationwide. Again, another competitive grant. Uh, there's a couple other transportation related ones that are here in California. I'm going to get to in a second, but this other little highlight in the middle that's 50 million, that's just me updating you on that regional resilience planning and implementation grant that's due. Uh, there's a, a due date of August 29th at the end of this month. Just letting you know that that actually doubled in funding. They got uh, a recent infusion. And so if you're like, we're on the fence, maybe we're, there's not enough to make it worth our while. Maybe this is something to push you off the fence because there's more to go around. And that's through OPR. All right, so CARB. And actually, I'm glad we have IELG here because they have a partnership with CARB to support some um, application assistance. And maybe, maybe they'll chime in. Um, so CARB and its climate, um, California Climate Investments Program has a whole pot of money called Low Carbon Transportation Investments, and there's a few grant programs that run out of that. One is called the Planning and Capacity Building Grants. It's $3 million. That doesn't sound like a huge amount to me, and it's for 6 to 15 grants for around, um, around the state. Um, and let's see, all of these are really intended to... Um, increase transportation equity by identifying and addressing communities, transportation needs, increasing access to key destinations and services and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. Um, and so there's free application assistance. You do have to apply for it through ILJ and their partners and the actual concept application. So there's a two phase application process. The first one is a concept application and that's due September 8th. Um, and I kind of like those two phase processes, to be honest, that way you don't have to waste your time doing a giant application if you're just not a contender. It's kind of like a mercy pull. <laughs> um, same thing, same timeline for this other one down here, the one, one right underneath, clean mobility in schools and the sustainable transportation equity project step. There's more money there. There's $30 million for those. Um, so again, if transportation is in your climate action plan or something that your transportation, you know, you might just get this over to the folks that are working on transportation. That one, you know, you have um, a little longer window. If you can get the concept paper in on September 8th, you'll have a little longer window to actually apply. Uh, ILJ, do you want to chime in here on any piece of that? Yeah, I mean, you covered it, but um, hi, everybody. This is Nikita Sinha. I'm a program manager with ILG. Um, just sharing, I, I dropped in the chat a link to the uh, application assistance sign up form. Um, and like it was mentioned, this is a two phased application process. So 
the first deadline that you're looking at is a September 8th concept application. If you're at all interested in any of these grants, definitely uh, reach out to us um, or sign up for the TA process. We're happy to just talk through what, what you're considering applying for, what your goals and priorities are and how they might match up with these. Um, because as mentioned, it isn't the, the largest funding amount. There's a limited number of grants. So we wanna be able to talk through any of those questions with you. Um, but the technical assistance for the applications is, is free. Um, it's through ILG, uh, People for Mobility Justice and Fair and Peers, that's our project team. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I know we'll talk a little bit more about grant applications later on the agenda. Thank you. Yeah, let's drop questions on that in the chat and we'll get to it when we got ILJ back in just a minute. I'm sorry, G. <laughs> Too many acronyms. All right, so um, the last thing I wanted to mention, you know, ILG is a great resource. All this free technical assistance with pre-application work is really useful, especially because we keep hearing from you guys at the bonus breakouts that we've been doing. The small communities are really struggling right now, really need some extra support. I imagine free TA is going to be really looking at helping those small communities without capacity. Uh, I also kept that in mind. I wanted to raise one opportunity for you guys um, that I think is applicable to you. So this is the last one I'm going to talk about. DOE, Energy Improvement in Rural or Remote Areas, ERA, Fixed Award Grant Program. So this is um, a program out of the Department of Energy. It's got a longer window. You've got till October 12th. So that's what I'm trying to pick at. Something that um, you know, I'm trying to find these opportunities that are a little further out so you have more time and that are specific to rural or remote smaller communities. So this is for community-based projects between 500,000 and 5 million. It doesn't require a cost share. And the projects funded will improve cost, reliability, environmental impact, and climate resilience of energy systems in rural or remote areas with 10,000 or fewer inhabitants. So the FOA on this one's kind of interesting. They're they're advertising that it utilizes a simplified application process and will award fixed amount grants and that, that it's supposed to significantly reduce financial reporting requirements with larger DOE awards. And again, they have T free TA available through the DOE as well. Okay, so those are the opportunities uh, that I wanted to highlight. We're gonna move into our speaker and actually this little blue thing at the bottom is my segue. So Cal MTA has a request for ideas uh, open right now. So we have a speaker who has joined us today. Um, she actually reached out wanting to reach this audience in particular. So Rachel, thank you for, for doing that. She is the Stakeholder Engagement Manager with the California Market Transformation Administrator, a new program of the CPC. Um, and so she's going to tell you all about that program and how you can help provide ideas to help meet California's greenhouse gas reduction goals through market transformation. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you so much, Angie. It's really wonderful to be here, um, and I appreciate you making this possible. Um, just wanted to say a quick introduction about CalMTA and the work that we're doing um, to complement the energy efficiency landscape in California, as well as provide a little information about uh, a request for ideas that is open now through August 18th. Um, so next slide, please. Great. Uh, so we are relatively new to the California EE market. Uh, we launched in January following a, a CPUC decision and framework that brings market transformation to uh, California. Our primary goal is to accelerate adoption of energy efficiency technologies and practices. We're also very much looking to complement and support other statewide goals, um, including statewide decarbonization work, grid flexibility, grid health, um, and especially always ensuring that equity is front and center, uh, approaching all initiatives through uh, an environmental and social justice lens. Uh, the CPUC and California ratepayers have invested uh, $320 million over an eight year period. And our primary goal is to develop and oversee a portfolio of statewide market transformation initiatives. We are administered by Resource Innovations. Um, PG&E is our fiscal agent, but we are very much a statewide uh, agency, and we do have a, a newly formed board of market transformation advisory board members and strategic partners, um, including a lot of uh, entities that will be familiar to folks on this call, like the Ortiz Group, uh, Cadmus, 2050 Partners, to really make sure that we have a broad range of, of expertise to, to support these initiatives. And is I believe the next slide. Oh. Great. So we do have a request for ideas that launched in June and is open until August 18th 
through an idea portal. And we're seeking, it is a true request for ideas. Uh, as a former proposal manager, I am very uh, aware of our, our sort of PTSD from lengthy applications and uh, cost effectiveness calculations and things like that. This is a, a series of about 13 questions. Each question is about 250 word limit. Um, so we're really trying to make it easy. Ideally, if you're familiar with the technology, it should take about an hour to two hours to complete this, this submittal form. And we're really just interested at this stage because we're so new, we're interested in hearing from the market. What do, what do we need? What market interventions are needed to make products and technologies that drive measurable and significant energy savings to kind of get our desired rate of adoption. Um, so it is it is genuinely, we are interested in hearing from market actors, from community-based organizations. And of course, every, everyone on this call, we know that you are really the, the experts and what your communities need to uh, adopt technologies that are going to benefit them. And um, there's more information on our website about just the market transformation framework and the kinds of products, technologies, and practices that we're seeking. But really at the at the core, you know, first and foremost, they have to save energy. That is, we are an energy efficiency organization that is that is critical as sort of that first barrier of entry. And then the highest potential, highest ranking ideas will be ones that also benefit from a market transformation theory framework um, and support these additional goals that we've talked about, including workforce development, equity, decarbonization. And just a note, I know there's not a ton of time before the idea portal closes on August 18th. This will be a, a recurring process. We anticipate opening our idea portal uh, probably quarterly moving forward after this first, uh, this first group of market transformation initiatives has been identified, approved by the CPUC and kind of developed to, be, to go out for implementation. Um, so this is, this is definitely not your only opportunity to have a voice in the process. And we do have office hours available um, for RFI support. The link will be in these slides. I also just wanted to flag that um, we have an open office hours session that will be available Thursday um, of this week from 3 to 4 p.m. Pacific time. And I'm just going to drop the link into the chat. Um, and anyone can join that. And our market transformation experts will be on the call to answer any questions that you might have um, about the process and just whether whether what you're thinking is a, a good fit for a market transformation approach. And I think that, is there another slide? <laughs> Perfect, yes. And these are kind of the, the best ways to stay informed about the work that we're doing. Um, and also just feel free to contact us directly. Um, we have a, a newsletter as well as a LinkedIn page that provide pretty regular updates on the work that we're doing and opportunities to participate. And uh, members of our team are always available to have, whether you're looking for an introductory meeting, um, just to learn more about market transformation and what that might look like in California, as well as um, whether your idea or the market transformation initiative that you want to see turned into a, a full-scale program uh, makes sense for us. So we are, we are definitely here to partner with you and to be a collaborative partner in the statewide energy efficiency landscape. Thank that you, Rachel. About it. I, yeah. Um, that was great. So you guys, uh, I actually, one question for you, Rachel, yeah. um, that office hour, is that a place where people can go and give live feedback? Can they actually just drop off their ideas there? So what I mean, we have sort of two options. So the, the Calendly link that is in the slides, people can schedule a one on one office hours. Um, and then that would just be meeting with one member of our MTI team. And folks have just been coming to these and a lot of them have a very specific thought or question. And our team can help sort of define whether it's a good fit for market transformation. Um, so, for example, some very emerging technology that's not really commercially available probably wouldn't be quite ready for this type of market intervention. Um, so we've had we've been able to kind of talk through that process and what that might look like. Um, our team can also help frame if, if there's something you want to see adopted more widely, but you're not really sure what that look might look like within a market transformation feedback or framework. Our team can also help define well, you could talk about it in this way or this way to kind of make your idea submittal a success. It's it's really intended to be a conversation and a, a collaborative one. 
the Thursday office hours will just be, you can drop in at any point. I'm not sure how many folks will be on the call, but we'll have a couple members of our MTI team there and you can bounce ideas and thoughts off, off that group. Well, great. All right, you guys, well, there's some links there too. You can find out more, you can give your input. Rachel, that was a good idea to come here because local governments and regional agencies around the state have been doing a lot of market transformation. They yep. have been <laughs> living and breathing it, trying to figure out how to crack that nut. They probably have a lot to say. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to our next speaker. Uh, two speakers, actually. So um, I am very pleased to invite our friends from the Institute for Local Government. Um, to come speak with us about, like I mentioned, they're going to talk to us about some tips and tricks for how to access all of these funding opportunities that are burying us underground <laughs> um, in a good way. So we have um, <clears throat> Nikita Sinha, she's a program manager, and Hannah Stelmakovich, which I think I butchered a little bit, but not horribly. You did just fine. <laughs> okay. All right, and she's also a program manager. So I'm going to hand it off to these guys for a presentation. In the chat, please drop your questions for these guys. We're going to have a Q&A session and a discussion afterwards. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. everybody able to see that? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, everybody. As mentioned, um, I'm Nikita Sinha. I'm a program manager with ILG, um, joined by Hannah Stomakovich, who's also a program manager with ILG. We have a, uh, um, a, just a couple slides and a presentation for you today talking about um, some of our experience with um, one of our programs, the Boost program, and de developing successful grant applications. Um, that's us. Um, so I am a program manager with ILG. I've been here for about two years. I primarily work in our sustainability pillar. Um, my, my prior experience ranges from transportation to, to land use and housing um, and a little bit of water use efficiency. Um, and so my, my interest is primarily in sustainable communities, but um, as is the case with many organizations, um, we all uh, wear multiple hats. Um, and one of the hats that I wear, which I'm, I'm lucky to get to work closely with Hannah on is um, public engagement um, and public engagement and sustainability often go hand in hand. Um, and Hannah's a, sustain, uh, a public engagement expert. So um, I'll let her introduce herself a little. Yes, uh, good Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. My name is Hannah Stelmakovic. I've been with the Institute for Local Government for about seven years, uh, splitting my time between what we call a public engagement pillar and sustainability uh, pillar. Uh, through these pillars, I work with a lot of um, you know, different subject areas, including um, community emission reduction plans, uh, climate action plans, uh, some transportation projects. Definitely at the Institute for Local Governments, we, <clears throat> we wear multiple ha hats and our team usually does all hands on deck approach. We're touching a lot of different subject areas working with the local governments. And on that note, so ILG is the nonprofit training affiliate of um, three organizations, the League of California Cities, California State Association of Counties, and California Special Districts Association. So our mission and essentially what we do is we serve local governments in California to do um, what you already do and, and uh, help you do it more, efficient, more efficiently, more successfully, and provide whatever um, support and resources are needed as uh, new issues come up and, and new challenges arise. Uh, and we've already previewed a little bit, but we do this in four different program areas. So leadership and governance, um, civics, education, and workforce, public engagement, and sustainable and resilient communities. Um, and we do this through a number of different ways, including educational materials, trainings, technical assistance, which we'll talk a bit about today, capacity building, which we'll also talk a bit about today, um, and then convenings and, and gatherings. Yeah, and before you go to the next slide, Nikita, I would like for those of you uh, on the line in the chat, if you've heard about us, if you worked with us, if you attended one of our webinars, trainings, access to educational materials, please drop in the chat, A, if you know us, and B, how do you know us? We would love to, uh, to learn how we are reaching not only in, uh, local governments, governments that we directly work with, uh, but also the rest of the state. We would love that feedback in the chat. Have you heard about us? How did we interact? Definitely, I definitely saw some folks on the line that, that are friends of biology. Um, so uh, as I think a couple of responses are coming in, 
Um, and I see SCE in there. Um, I'll pass it to Hannah to talk a little bit about our boost program and then um, we'll be happy to answer some of these questions um, in our Q&A or we can pause right now and answer them, Hannah. Of course. Uh, and I see a few, a few questions. Uh, Karen, I've attended a webinar too. Thank you, Karen. We put, uh, put out a lot of webinars. Uh, hey, on behalf of SC, we we'll love working with you at ILG. Thank you. A question from Ron will answer in the chat. So yes, thank you for sharing a little bit. Okay, so part of our work at the Institute for Local Government, um, in 2019, we've received funding from Strategic Growth Council and we launched what we call a boost pilot program and BOOST stands for Build, Organize, Optimize, Strengthen, and Transform. Uh, the program had two rounds, uh, pilot and round two, and we've been working with local governments through this BOOST program for about four years with four di different local governments. So what did we do in that BOOST program? We help with a lot of grants. Uh, we've helped uh, local governments finding for grants, applying for grants, exploring grants, and we'll talk a little bit about that work and what we've learned from that experience in just a few minutes. As part of the BOOST program, it's flexible technical assistance program. So we definitely help local governments uh, with project development. And it could have been a variety of projects, anything between climate action plans, environmental justice, uh, hazard mitigation plans, uh, community engagement, whatever local governments who are working with us directly needed. Uh, we provided direct connections to existing state uh, technical assistance and funding programs. Again, part of our uh, working on grants uh, process was really uh, connecting local governments to the state so to build that capacity to speed up those uh, grant application processes. Partnership development was huge for us, uh, understanding who is in the community, who is not engaged, who can be that potential partner for the grant applications. And again, we've talked about that aspect in just a bit. Uh, climate action and resilience planning, we've helped our jurisdictions with that. Community engagement, training and facilitation services, peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities, communication support. So again, Boost, Boost program is uh, all, ha all hands on deck. We really try to work with our uh, partner jurisdictions, figure out their needs, uh, figure out our expertise capacity, and um, help them with what the projects that they need, uh, specifically projects focused on climate action and resilience planning. Great, and um, just to respond to a question in the chat, so the BOOST program specifically that we're talking about, this was a, a program funded through the Strategic Growth Council. So we worked with 19 jurisdictions overall between round one and round two, um, and that was at no cost to um, the jurisdiction, each, each jurisdiction. And in that time, um, we, uh, we took on a lot. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of opportunities available. And so our role is supporting um, those 19 jurisdictions. Part of what we took on is that grant writing and grant support piece. Um, so over the course of our two boost rounds, um, four years, we worked on 86 grant applications. Um, a lot of this work is assessing whether or not the grant is suitable or appropriate for um, the goals of the agency that and it meets the project that they're looking to get funded. And then we did that all the way through the community engagement process, scoping out the partnership partners for the grant application, the writing of it, um, um, the whole the whole process. Um, and through that, uh, 80, through, through those 86 grants, we were able to help um, agencies bring in $73 million. Um, and that's the asterisk there is that additional, additional uh, grant awards are pending. We just wrapped up round two of the boost program. And so we're waiting, um, waiting to hear back on several more of those. Um, but but um, through, through those uh, grants, at, at the very least of that $73 million, um, in addition to a lot of the other work that we did with the agencies on, on planning, engagement, partnership development, um, and exploring other opportunities. Awesome. So we would love to share a little bit what we've learned uh, working with more than 19 different jurisdictions, uh, exploring, assisting, applying for more than 86 uh, grant applications. What are some our takeaways for our teams and how do we observe, uh, you know, takeaways about local government capacity? How can we build capacity? How can we be more intentional about those grants? And ultimately, how can we be more successful with our grant applications? 
Definitely internal coordination is the key, whether you're a big jurisdiction agency, city, county, or small city. I think internal uh, coordination, A, help, help local governments to understand what capacity exists to even start exploring these grants. Have we uh, have a different department applied for a similar uh, project, a somewhat similar project in the past? Um, what is is there like additional maybe civic spark fellow who can help with this existing applications we found that even when we start exploring grant applications bringing a team uh, like department heads or uh, department ma managers together and start exploring what is this grant about what some potential projects should we go for it or not was incredibly successful and incorporating for example city managers uh, office uh, those um, those uh, internal coordinations having a team and not just like one human exploring the potential grants uh, that are available in the next two, three, four months was critical. And also it helped to generate those additional support across the department. So kind of minimizing those silos a little bit. Those um, internal coordinations I were critical at the begin beginner exploring stage of the grant because uh, we would start thinking about those long-term plans um, in advance, for those of you who applied for multiple grants, you know that long-term implementation plan or maintenance plan, uh, uh, for example, when you're applying for urban greening, right? How are you going to sustain those trees for the next 20 years? So bringing those folks early on in the exploration stage of the grant from different departments who can potentially sustain those trees was also very critical um, to put together a, a very thoughtful, a very intentional uh, grant application. And I'm sure from your experience, you, you know that when state folks read our grant application, they can tell where <laughs> application is very intentional and very thought out with a lot of details versus application where like, okay, we have one week left, let me figure out that what, what that one person can do with that application to put it together. Right, and then um, partnership building is a, another piece of this. So um, looking outside of the agency, once you do that internal coordination, looking outside of the agency as well to uh, within your community to see who are those partners that you can work on developing relationships and then also taking that next step of, of figuring out how to submit a joint application um, or, or work together on a project. Um, more and more state agencies are looking for either co-applicants or sub-applicants on grant applications. Um, and in order to be able to, to respond to that and, and improve your grant applications and submit um, uh, competitive applications, um, you need to start with the basis of building relationships and building trust with the organizations and with the community and the community leaders um, and stakeholders in, in your community. Um, by building those relationships and strengthen, strengthening those relationships, identifying mutual goals, um, and then also understanding capacity, both the internal capacity as well as um, what uh, other organizations are working on, um, interested in working on their expertise and their capacity. Um, you'll be able to uh, really build meaningful partnerships that will allow you to have um, a, a more competitive edge on grant applications. So um, with, with some of the jurisdictions we worked with, what this looked like is um, bringing together CBOs where there was already an existing relationship, but bringing together CBOs in the in the community to really talk about what were the key issues that they're facing. And once you ha have that free flowing dialogue and really hear from everybody, it was it was much easier for that city then to to over the next six months look at the grant opportunities that were coming out and say, hey, this actually lines up perfectly with what our school district was saying or what this housing organization was saying, and then bring them into that conversation of um, we're interested in applying for this, is this something you're interested in and figuring that piece out. Um, there's also the reality that for um, rural jurisdictions, there may not be nonprofits or community-based organizations that are serving that area, um, which is definitely a challenge if you're looking at a grant application that's looking for um, a, a partner on it, um, you, you might have to think outside of the box and be creative there. And so with some of the jurisdictions that we work with to boost, that, that was the school district or that was a hospital or um, it was the county, the, the county departments that had local offices. Um, so just being really creative about who those partners are. They don't have to be um, the nonprofits. They can be those community leaders and other key stakeholders in the region. Yes, and cultivating partnerships um... 
needs to happen before you know you learn about the certain grant opportunity also in uh, when you if 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 the agency has an opportunity to convene uh folks who work in the community uh understand what they're working on and kind of like you know make that those mental notes uh for the future so when the grant opportunity arrive we're not scrambling for uh new partners or we're not uh, scrambling to figure out who can we reach out from the existing partnerships we kind of build those relationships in advance and more than that we we've learned what each uh you know nonprofit works at what capacity they have what are some uh, passionate community residents uh, who are actually investing their personal time in um, you know promoting uh, for example sustainable uh, biking in the community they can be your partner on the grant uh, on the grant application they can help you to give you additional capacity on this grant applications we had residents uh, actually drafting some of the parts of the narrative for us and then we were polishing that and weaving it together in the application Again, working with some of the smaller jurisdictions, we had to get incredibly creative about the partnerships, but also what we've learned um, when the grant applications, we've learned about the dates. It's like, OK, we have two months to put it together. It's harder to get everyone in the room. So if being strategic about let's create the space for um, partners, community members to meet and just discuss what is happening, what they're working on. In this way, we build this collective uh, knowledge about everyone's work capacity resources. And as an agency, you can then strategically tap into uh, certain groups and bring them on board. Okay. And that leads us to community engagement. As you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you on the line have applied for the state grants. Uh, community engagement is getting more and more grant points <laughs> on those applications. Community engagement, authentic community engagement is incredibly critical. What does it mean? It means that the projects that we're proposing on our grant applications have to come from the community, have to be informed by the community engagement. Um, uh, the idea of authentic and inclusive uh, engagement is that we design our project together with the community and folks who don't traditionally participate, folks who have been left out of decision making for a bit, quite a few times now, now are part of this pro process. So definitely community engagement is key because it informs those project designs and that's what state and I think federal state federal would like to see on those applications and definitely generates that support for your project when community is part of the uh, project proposal development. Uh, they, they get on board earlier on. Uh, sustained engagement is also uh, very critical. I think what makes applications more successful and is when uh, you also make an, a, a case in your community engagement section that community will continue to stay engaged through the project development or uh, once the project launch, it can be anything between organizing uh, maybe some community events on the on the new site or doing some cleanup days, uh, whatever makes for the application. And of course, ensuring equity, meaning that uh, not only uh, in engagement was inclusive uh, for this particular project design application uh, process, but also engagement was accessible, meaning different members of the community had an opportunity to participate and provide the feedback. You provided language access, translation, interpretation as needed, and you reached out to different uh, uh, groups of your community. Your engagement was very representative of socio-demographic landscape of your uh, city or county or jurisdiction, whatever, is, um, whatever, whatever the area is. So just a few words on the community engagement. We had to we had to be creative because engagement fatigue is real. Sometimes we have two weeks to put together an application and perhaps you know engagement is hard to do and those almost impossible to do. So what we've done creatively in one of the cities we worked with, we tap into our community community leaders, uh, community residents who've been kind of part of the whole process because the project we were proposing, I think it was trail extension. It's It's been, you know, it's been, um, it's been going for a while, like how can we build this tra trail ex extension? So what I personally did, I, I called a few members and I'm like, okay, ha has engagement happened in the past? I'm sure, you know, there was talks about it. Let, let me, let us take the trip down to memory lane. Talk to me about experiencing past engagements. And we pulled those stories out of, uh, you know, residents had, so to speak, and I weaved it into community engagement section because for that particular project, we did not have a chance to do all this 
brand new engagement, but by doing like three to four interviews with the residents about some past engagement opportunities and how did it go? Do you remember what feedback they were asking for? I was able to weave it into the narrative and the application did receive funding. So definitely think creatively about community engagement back to your internal coordination with uh, uh, with the with the departments, with the uh, city, county, or jurisdiction, what engagement has taken place recently? What other departments learned from the community about X, Y, Z? Can you take that community data, what I call it, feedback that we've got from the community, and can you weave that feedback into your community engagement section and show how what we've heard from the community is actually aligns uh, with what we're proposing, with the caveat that uh, previous engagements were inclusive and equitable. So yes, engagement fatigue is real. Just be creative. How can you build up on existing engagement, whether you're talking to the residents about their previous engagement experiences or talking to the uh, uh, other departments about what they've done in the past and what data do they have? Yeah, exactly. So um, connecting some of these different, different pieces, community engagement definitely ties in with that internal coordination and the partnerships as well. Um, and then just to round us out, um, the technical assistance portion of this. So uh, there are so many grant opportunities available, um, uh, so many different things that are coming out from the state level, regional level, um, and federal level. And so I think more and more agencies are looking to provide that assistance um, so to help um, local agencies navigate all of the opportunities. Um, so taking advantage of technical assistance, sometimes that means um, reaching out to the, the funder, the funding agency directly, that can have a really big benefit of even just talking through like, is my project eligible for this grant? Um, or, um, or looking for technical assistance programs that are specific to, to housing, specific to economic development. Um, and more and more of those are, are coming online um, regionally through the MPOs and, and the COGS. And then um, uh, on the state level, there's um, like, again, I'll put in the, 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 the plug for our um, application technical assistance and you'll see more and more state grants that do have um, that technical assistance at no cost. Um, and then the federal agencies as well have also started opening up um, more technical assistance programs that look at a, a variety of um, different um, uh, different focus areas that are are really great for just acknowledging that it's it's hard for, especially if you're a one person team, it's hard to look through an 80 page guideline document document and understand what from this do I really need to be looking at to understand if I can even apply um, just that starting place. And so taking advantage, just connecting with the funder, connecting with the resources that they've provided um, and, and they're making available can have the benefit of, um, uh, you, you might hear from an agency that it's not the right application. You might hear from an agency of this is the exact type of project that we're looking to fund. And that really gives you the, the, the ability to prioritize and say, Okay, this should be our. This should be an application that we do get in because we have a we have a shot at this. Um, that's something that we've we've seen um, time and time again with the agencies we're working with. Uh, I'm going to keep us moving in the interest of time. Um, we have some just kind of additional tips or or just things that we want to highlight. Um, I'll go through a couple and then I'll pass it to Hannah. But just that reality check of be realistic about the timing. Do what you can uh, before before grants before you even know about a grant that will set you up best. And that is making, building those relationships um, with, with uh, organizations in your community, um, understanding your community's priorities, um, learning about what's going on across departments or within the organizations so that you have these projects that um, you have in, in, your, in your head as goals or priorities to get funding for. And then um, look at projects that can provide multiple benefits. So. Um, a transportation project that also has greening elements. You could talk about the greenhouse gas reduction, the public health impacts, the, the, um, the heat reduction impacts. Um, those are the types of applications that funders are, are really looking at that have those, those benefits across a, a couple different areas. And you're really showing that, that holistic approach to how you're looking at serving the community. Um, I'll pass it over to Hannah for the other two. Uh, am I doing the last two boxes? <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, so what also we've learned from our experience and just talking to other uh, cities who submitted successful application, uh, visualizing the need in your community is something that can help your application to stand out. Everyone who is implying there's a need, there's a dire need. Uh, so how do we show the state what is the need? So uh, the very like low, low key approach, uh, Google Maps, when you say, okay, this is the project, I'm going to connect community to those grocery things, to those parks, to the churches. What I've seen communities do in the Google, Google Maps that put those pinpoints where the community is going to be connected or highlighted the areas on the map where, uh, you know, we're bringing more features in the community and this is the community around it, how it's going to benefit uh, providing pictures. So anything you can do to think creatively about how you can visualize the need to tell that story to the state we've seen that work that's working in the past and again be creative i've shared with you a little bit about public engagement and how we were getting trying to get creative because again low capacity faster timeline uh, not enough resources to do engagement uh, with the rest of the application uh, you can do the same be creative with your partners see if you can ask uh, be creative with your um, internal coordination see if you can ask someone to draft some parts of the application for you if you're just a mighty team of one definitely we we found it we found it very helpful and then just a couple couple quick pictures of of some of our work with the agencies that we worked with um, we got to work with these agencies for um, a year and a half and so getting to go into the community um, seeing seeing everything like hannah was mentioning those visuals even for us um, were, were amazing and, and um, just really grateful for all the opportunities that we had to work with these agencies. Yeah, absolutely. And just real quick, how did we learn about all those grants? <laughs> For me, Civic Well was actually a starting point. They did do tremendous research jobs putting together all this uh, grant opportunity opportunities. And also we just subscribed to as many agencies with serves as we could humanly could in the past, all the various pra pra grant programs. So we we knew in advance uh, that the guidelines guidelines are being developed. Even as we develop, we like pay attention what potential projects start talking to our jurisdictions. Hey, this is what's coming out. Let's brainstorm. What do you have on the horizon? Because you know, once the guidelines are out, it's like the race to the due date. So definitely, um, even as guidelines are being developed, start thinking, start coordinating that's something that helped us in the past we do have a quick question from uh jody thank you so much uh with all these partnerships and engaging residents and community-based organizations what about stipends and mini grants do we have any suggestions going forward on what the state considers as it looks at applications with stipends and how do you best develop those budgets so jody are you asking about like what state expects to see on the application in terms of those budget proposals for stipends or how do we think what is the good amount could you clarify that for us um both i mean we we put something together but uh th th that was for me one of the harder things to um to navigate was just how to like how much to include, what's what's a reasonable amount for um, an individual who comes to yeah. a meeting where we're providing Absolutely. child care and food and translation, but we still want to value their time. Is a $25 gift card enough? Do they need yes. a check? So just yes. like, like that. And then the other thing I would say, since you gave me the microphone for a minute, is um, I, in my county, we have... Um, one area of our county where there's a pretty well-developed network of community-based organizations. And then another area, we have many, many impacted communities, but another area that does not have a great network of community-based organizations focused on um, climate change and environmental sustainability. So we did, uh, we are working with groups that haven't historically considered this their, their mission um, to educate them and help them see opportunities. But, um, it's been really interesting and I get worried for the community groups about being inundated by requests from Absolutely. Uh, yes. from, from different groups. Even on this call, people have been private messaging me and I'm like, I haven't told, you're gonna hear this soon, whoever it is I'm communicating with, but like, I don't wanna overwhelm my community groups. I need them to be ready yes. when the right opportunity comes up for them, not even so much for me, but for them, right? So. Yeah. Just speaking to that second point about overwhelming the community groups, um, I think using 
uh, using that, the, the, when you're building the relationships, just considering creative ways to build up capacity of different organizations. Um, uh, if you're co-applying for grants, maybe the, the, the government agency has a larger capacity to take on the administrative side of it, uh, but, but just building up um, CBOs if possible on um, how to, um, to, to, to building up their capacity to manage a grant of, that, of, of these sizes or also, um, and, and also what you've already said of just being creative about, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a sustainability or an environmental justice related CBO that you're working with. Um, just building those relationships and understanding what are the focus areas. And you might find that there are um, organizations that have other focus areas that um, would be good fits and, and are good fits for serving the community. Word, word of, cat, word of um, just sort of advice, I guess, for others. I recently, I'm just completing a grant where we had a budget for stipends and it was really hard for us to process those as a, as a, as a government agency. And in talking with the person in our county who ran our census work, she, was, she said, have the community groups administer the stipends. It's much easier for them. So yes. um, that was just a little tip yeah. of the trade that we picked up recently, but it's, it's tricky. And our yes. auditor, when they review our invoices, they're like, why are you giving this group money? Why are you giving this person money? So you really do have to think about that a lot because the state wants this and, you know, and it's great. I totally agree with it. It's just making it happen can be a challenge. Yes, absolutely. What we've seen in, in the field is that, yes, someone else is administering those stipends distributions. Also, back to the amounts, uh, we, we ask community members, community-based organizations, um, you know, what do you think would work in the community? What do you think is fair? Is it a stipend? Is it a gift card? Like, you have to talk to the few folks to figure, um, yeah, don't don't just make those calls. Ask for the community what, what would be appropriate. Um, with AB 617 work uh, the, that air districts implement, all of them are using stipend structures. So if you would like to just see, uh, go on their websites, just um, different air quality districts and see how they propose those stipend structures and administer and what's amounts, because amounts really vary by the state and by the project. Uh, it can be anything between gift cards and small um, you know, checks to, to larger amounts, and it can be administered either by um, a lot of nonprofits help to administer those stipends. So there's definitely uh, some creative solutions are, do exist, uh, you know, AB 617 work taught us uh, quite a bit, what, how can we play with those stipends, what, what's fair, what's appropriate, uh, but definitely uh, I do want to acknowledge the struggle and that we continue to continue to be creative about that. That was such a good question. Thank you, Jody. I can't tell you how many times I see that in an application and that the figuring out the dollar amount, that's tricky and something I've had to deal with too. I think, you know, obviously it depends on how involved they're going to be, right? If they're a true partner, right now I'm writing sub awards for true partners, right? That are expected to be at the table over and over again. But if you're just showing up to a workshop, maybe that's different. But yeah, great question. Um, you know, there's a couple logistics questions, but maybe before we get there, just one more for you guys. Um, I imagine, you know, what I hear from folks is that what they really need is almost to duplicate their DNA, right? Like need more manpower. Um, but I'm wondering, on top of manpower, what when you go into a community, what's different about your approach? How are you kind of course correcting or adding value in the approach and the process? Things that they wouldn't have done otherwise if it hadn't been for you guys coming in with this level of expertise. I found in my experience, um, a lot of the times it really is just being that extra person and having those, those that extra set of eyes um, to to do the the follow up on we didn't receive this grant and so reaching out to the funder to talk about why or um, we have this grant we're interested in but that one person it really can be hard to have that that time to get to dig into the guidelines and really just being that connector um, and um, uh, doing that extra bit of communication that is really challenging when you're that one one person team. Andrew, could you repeat the question? I'm just trying to wrap my head around it. Approach in terms of public engagement or just grant 
applications. Even at the application, yeah. You know, for example, I think a lot one of the really hard points up front is like that go or no go point, right? Like you do go, oh yeah a sufficient grant review so you can see where those fatal flaws and mm -hmm. might step in. Like don't even apply for this grant because yes. now on page 462, there's a cost share that I that you can't manage. You yeah. know, something like that. Absolutely. Now, it's a great question. And if one of my jurisdictions in my track list, I have explored 17 grants, applied for two. When I say explored, we had like up to three calls with the state. So definitely the guidelines is the first, looking at the, uh, you know, the, the award amounts, understanding how competitive the grant is. For example, a lot of you know that urban greening is kind of competitive, right? So it's kind of low capacity city, don't have a lot of, maybe that competitive grant, maybe let's pass on that and see if there's some new new urban greening types of grants can come up with that we apply. So how competitive it is, how big the reward. Um, and then uh, we set up calls with the state to confirm the eligibility of the project. And then we assess if partners are available. Sometimes in the past, we decided not to go for the project because we needed a school partner and school was on summer recess when the applications were due. And that partner was critical. So we decided not to go for it, even though we, we had a good project. Uh, so definitely, yes. And then figure out, figuring out if, uh, you know, how much time we have to put the application together doing this like reality check. Now that we know our project is eligible, we should kind of apply for it. Uh, uh, let's do the reality check. Who do we, do we have on staff? What what else is on staff plate? Is it feas feasible to put this application together? And that's when we were creative about, okay, well, who else can help us? Can we like tap someone? Is this like an application from maybe two years ago when we copy paste something? Is existing description about the community already is there we can just copy paste it uh do we have like maybe a passionate community member who can actually help us to draft a public engagement based on uh, their experience so definitely a lot of different points angel really really good uh really good uh question spend a lot of time being intentional even on goal or no goal yeah right it's like yeah be selective well thank you for that i feel like we could talk for another two, yes <laughs> three hours um and maybe we bring you guys back because these I want to dive in even deeper on some of these tricky, mm -hmm. tricky pieces of this that really trip people up. But I want to say thank you so much for being here. And if you wouldn't mind before you go, maybe drop your email or however you want them to contact you into the chat. Um, and I think somebody asked if there's a fee. If you are selected by the Booth program, there's no fee. That's the whole point. And so um, maybe give them the link so that they can find out how to take advantage of that opportunity. Let's go back to our last closing slide. And so we've got just a couple of things to say here, and then we're gonna go into our um, our little extra 15 minutes who, for whoever wants to hang around, um, where I think I'm gonna keep this little discussion piece up top um, for that. But I wanted to just say, you know, wrapping up that conversation, I was just at CAF last week, the Climate Adaptation Forum, Civic Goal puts it on. We had a lot of conversations about improving funding deployment, right? So some, the fact that TA has come out of the woodworks and we're spending all this money on TA to support grants signals, you know, if you look big picture signals that there's like maybe something to look at in terms of the way we're deploying funding that's a little too complicated. And so um, I just wanted to have that conversation. I'm thinking big thoughts about it and I wanna hear more from you. So stick around in that extra 15 minutes. But I do wanna also point out like, please take advantage of ILJ, ILG services um, because they're going to give you a really deep dive into support, which is what a lot of you really need is like an extra member of your team, right? If you want somebody who can kind of help you do that first wash a little bit further beyond of what we do here, which is just making you aware of opportunities, I want you to contact me um, if you'd like, and I can give you just a little bit of like a one-on-one -on -one individualized grant help. That might look like you telling me what your near-term funding priorities are and me telling you what I know in terms of where the right maybe what some good programs are to be pursuing um, as a first go and some of the key points of those solicitations um, so that's available to you as well and we love our friends over at ILG we used to be in formal partnership back when in the older seek program days so it's nice to be back in conversation with you all um, let's go to the next slide please so for this time this is the end of our official meeting we are going to stick around for 15 minutes of more informal time and that means any of you can bring up a topic as well and if you want to talk more about accessing funding um, i'm always here i got a ear for that our next meeting is september 12th 
Um, please tell a friend. You can share this invitation with others, anybody who you think would benefit from getting this sneak peek headway, you know, get a little more headway on these opportunities so you have more time to really focus on applying for the right ones. All right, so with that, thank you all for being here. Go if you need to, and otherwise, hang around. Let me explain to you a little bit about what this bonus time is about. <laughs>